Morning, everyone. Morning to those who are here in the hall and those who are with us online. Always a pleasure to be um, here at Assembly Hall. As I said last week, it's an assembly as I regard as one of my home assemblies. Um, today I brought with me uh, our brother Marvin Palmer, who is uh, he's sitting with me at the back there. He's our most recent member at ELM, was baptized and brought into fellowship last year. Uh, Marvin is a very, very promising um, young man, a promising man of God. So I decided to invite him uh, because I wanted him to know Assembly Hall. You know, so yeah, as I said, I didn't share this with, with Marvin, Marvin before, but this is the other assembly in Kingston, I regard as my home assembly. And of course, St. Elizabeth, Aberdeen, where I'm from. I was here three years, at least three years and more when I was at Michael. And so this became my home assembly. I struggled with um, inviting Marvin anyway, but in the end, I decided I would bring him because I wanted to convince myself that I'm a forgiving person. Uh, see, I came here last week and um, no, not Karen. Um, D was telling me that they have no, that uh, Marvin is a part of the Christian Ambassadors football team. And um, I paused a little bit. Because, you know, really, I, I don't know if any of you know, but um, I'm one of the greatest football talents this country has ever produced. And Burley, <laughs> you must have some respect, please. And um, no, they didn't invite me to come to Christian Ambassadors. And Marvin just come in the faith and they invited him. But I, I decided I'm a forgiving person, so I, I don't hold it against me. He will have to answer. Well, last week we looked at, um, in the series of singleness, ideal marriage and family, we looked at, the, we looked at singleness last week. I spoke about the fact that, you know, single, the, the time of singleness, you know, your single period, it's a time when you have a tremendous opportunity to do just about anything for the Lord. You are not accountable, in a sense, to anybody as such. Not that you're not accountable to your elders, but you don't have any husband or any wife or any children that you have to give first place. You can just go all out for the Lord and work for him. This week, we're going to look at um, the ideal marriage. We'll look at the ideal marriage. And um, when we speak of ideal, we, we think of perfect or suitable or as close to perfect as possible. But we think of, you know, things ideal. We want it to be as close as possible to that which is perfect. And we know in this, in this life, you know, we don't accomplish perfection. But when you speak of an ideal marriage, you really want the best possible. And an ideal marriage, you think of things like um, always you know, joy, always happiness, always laughing. You think of the ideal marriage and you think of two persons who really love each other and will go all out for each other to do everything for each other. They will go all out to make the other person feel good to help the other person to accomplish and to be himself and all of that. The, the, the ideal marriage is where you put the interest of the other first. And when you think of your partner, you know, you think, you know, this feeling of a warm feeling of acceptance and love and belonging, you know, flow through you. These are some of the things that mark an ideal marriage. These are some of the the evidences or some of the consequences or the results or the outcomes of an ideal marriage. And today we're not going to look so much at how we, we enjoy the ideal marriage, but I think it might profit you a little more if I help you to look at how do you accomplish the ideal marriage. So you may be somebody who is not yet married. I'm hoping that this will help you. But I'm also thinking that if you've been married for five years, for one year, or for 30 years, that there will be something from the word that will help you to 
to move your marriage towards that ideal. Move your marriage to where it is better for you, it's better for your partner, it's better for the Lord, it's better for the kingdom. So let's look at it. And um, I try to, I'm using scriptures that are commonly used, but I'm trying to frame it in a way that you will remember and will understand. And so there are four things I, I want to highlight about the, the right, about the ideal marriage. And the ideal marriage begins with finding the right person. Begins with finding the right person. Um, the ideal marriage is accomplished when we get married at the right time. Finding the right person, getting married at the right time. Third, having a right attitude towards your partner. And fourth, driven by the right motive. So these are four things, not the only four things, but four things I believe will contribute to the, an, a marriage moving towards the ideal or contribute to somebody who is not yet married, you know, striving for the ideal. Finding the right person, getting married at the right time, having the right attitude, and also possessing the right motive for marriage. So let's begin with finding the right person. And let me say right out. One of the problems we have with, with marriages is that we, we believe that there is one right person that God has, has made and put up either in storage or in the fridge or on some shelf for, for every one of us. And uh, that is not so. There are some persons who will, will predict and prophesy that two people must get married. Be wary of persons like those. I don't believe, the scripture does not tell us that there is any one person that God has picked out to be your wife or to be your husband. God wants you to be involved in the process. And he will help you to find a right person. So even though I start by talking about finding the right person, it's not that there is any one right person for you. There are right persons, but you need to know how to find those right persons. And one of the first ways of finding the right person is of finding someone with whom you can be equally yoked. Find somebody that you can be equally yoked to. There's a verse I'm going to use. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 commands us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You know, there are so many persons who are getting married now and we know that um, men are scarce in the church. Not many men in the church. And even among the few men who are in the church, not many of them, not many of us are of good marriage material. It's unfortunate, but it is so. And so many of us look outside, begin to look outside. But regardless of how scarce the pickings are inside the church, my encouragement to you is to find somebody in the church. It may not be somebody from your local assembly. It may not be somebody from your own denomination, although that's something else you have to be looking at. You have to be wise. But I'm suggesting to you that if you go outside and be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, you are not going to have an ideal marriage. You're not going to have a marriage that has the blessing of God on it. And this does not mean that God is going to doom your marriage or there's just going to be all kind of stress and struggles of all sorts, but you will not be able to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish in marriage. So in finding the right person, you need to rule out that person. It doesn't matter how nice he is or how nice she is. If he or she is not a believer, if they have not accepted Christ as the Lord and Savior, you need to rule them out. That marriage will not be of God and it will come with its own crosses. But, and so the Bible says, do not, be un, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. But I want to suggest, even though I don't have a verse like this in the Bible, let make it clear that neither should we be unequally yoked with uncommitted believers. As I said, there is not a verse in the Bible that says you must not be unequally yoked with uncommitted believers. But there are a whole other verses in the Bible that says you must be wise in everything you do. And if you are someone, 
We spoke about last week, young people who are on fire for the Lord, young people who have time for the work and commit themselves to the work of the Lord. And if you are somebody who has committed himself, wants to be involved in the work of the Lord, don't you marry somebody who is just a nominal Christian, somebody who is just saving a business with anybody else, somebody who just save and just come to church. Now, that person may be saved. The reality is the person may not be saved at all. But let's just accept that that person may be saved. That person is saved. That person is a carnal Christian. He is an immature Christian. He's not growing. He's not interested in witnessing to anybody. He's not interested in doing anything at work, at church. He's not even interested in, in devotion at home. He is not interested in the things of the Lord. He just say, well, I'm saved and I'm okay. That's the wrong person to marry. My recommendation is that you find somebody who is also committed to the work. They don't have to be committed as fully as you are. But it has to be a Christian who, who loves the Lord and wants to be used by the Lord. If you want to be used by the Lord, don't, don't marry a deadbeat. And the church is full of deadbeats. Don't marry them. So finding the right person means that you have to pray, means that you have to seek counsel, means that you have to get in the word and understand what God expects from the Christian wife, from the biblical husband. You have to understand for yourself what God wants and how and, and, and who it is who is going to help you to, to be that person and to, 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 to live that kind of life that God wants. Finding the right person is the first step to an ideal marriage. But secondly, getting, getting married at the right time is also another good step. There are a lot of people who, you know, when you talk to them, they tell you about their plan for the next 10 years or the next 15 years. And included in that plan for the next 50 years, at age 25 or 27, I'm going to get married and at another fixed time, I'm going to have children. There are some things that we don't have control over. And, you know, exactly when you're going to marry, you probably don't have any control over that. And those persons, well, not those, but some of those persons, many of those persons who have a fixed date that this is when I'm going to get married or I need to get married by this time, usually... When the time is coming and they don't have anybody, they rush to find somebody and desperation sets in because I have to get married by age 25 or 27 or 30, whatever it is. And so they end up with the wrong kind of person. Christian, yes, but not the right kind of person because they were rushing not to find the right person, but rushing to, to um, satisfy their own timelines. But there is a way to know that you're getting married at the right time. And um, I just realized, believe it or not, that I had not read my text. And now that I want the text, I realized that. Um, so let's look, let's look at Ephesians 5. And let's quickly read from verse 22 to 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. Now at the, now at the church, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loves the church, loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about the, the Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. There's quite a bit to unpack here, so I will have to kind of move to a little bit quicker. Getting married at the right time is getting married when one has matured 
and gain sufficient independence from his or her parents. The first time you know that this is the right time to get married is when you have matured to the point where you have gained sufficient independence from your parents. Here it says um, in verse 31, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And of course, this is a quote from Genesis 2, where 24, where Adam says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. You know that you're, get, you're ready to be married when you have matured to the point where you can now, you know, um, exercise independence from your parents. And there are four things that mark independence, or at least four things that mark independence from your parents. And the first is physical independence. It says a man shall leave his father and mother. You leave your parents' house. When a man gets married and lives in his parents' house, it's an indication that he's not quite ready to be married. Folks, I know that I may be speaking to somebody now who right here in the hall or online who is in this situation. And you'll find very good reasons why you have to live in your parents' house. If that's the case, then find a way to work it out. But my suggestion is based on the word, on the strength of the word of the Lord, is that if you have to still live in your parents' house for whatever reason, you may not be ready to be married. You must be ready to, for physical independent, independence. And here Adam says, a man shall leave his father and his mother. You need to leave your parents' house. You need to be ready to establish something on your own. Now, the fact that a man is, or a woman is married and living with his parents may not be because, you know, they think that they need to live with their parents, but it may be because of a, a mistaken notion we have, not just in Jamaica here, but other parts of the world, that when we get married, we link together. We link families together. You extend families together. No, when you get married, you, you start a new unit. It's a, a new unit of, of a, a family that is committed to God. It is not the joining of two families. It is starting a new family. And so um, Adam said, and this was before sin entered, and this is not even a result of sin. He says, a man shall leave his father and be united to his wife. Physical independence is one indication that the time has come for you to be married. A second indication is economic independence, being able to provide for his own household. First Timothy 5 verse 8 says, anyone who does not provide for his relatives and especially those of his own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now this is not a verse that is used often when we are speaking about marriage, but here it's saying, you know, if you cannot provide for your own household, you're worse than an infidel. And anyone who does not provide for them, right. So if you cannot provide for your household, um, Paul is suggesting here that you really have no reason, you have no right being married. You must be able to provide for your family. And the family begins, the family does not begin until after you have acquired a wife. So, so economic independence is suggesting that um, we should be able to stand on our own. It does not mean that you cannot accept um, help from your parents. It does not mean that you cannot, um, your parents can't help you with some money. But it means that you should be able to provide. There may be, there are all kinds of crises. We cannot, we don't control the circumstances, you know, that we live in. We don't control things that happen around us. Death comes and sickness comes and all kind of losses, job loss and all. All kind of things can happen so that we may need help. We're not talking about this. We're talking about a man who is saying to his girlfriend, I'm ready to marry you. Don't have a, I don't have a job yet, but I'm ready to marry. And this is also not saying that if you are working and your spouse is not working, that you can't marry. But if you're not work, if, if he's not working or she's not working, he, the man, especially, 
And um, he's, he's saying things like, you know, I don't have a job yet, but I'm sending out my resumes and I'm going to talk to that person and I'm going to talk to that one. And if I don't get a job, this is what I think I'm going to do. He's thinking, he's ambitious, he's preparing himself. That may be an indication that you can contemplate marriage. But if the fellow is saying to you, well, I'm not working, but you're bringing X amount a month, so that can tide us over. You need to take one in. In the country, you say, in the country, we say, take one in. You know, that's a big flag. And it, it's not a flag that have, has the colors of, of, of the black, green, and gold. It's a big red flag. If he's planning on your income, and I'm speaking especially about the man, or if he's, if he's making plans to sustain his family on your income, and he doesn't have any ideas to, or any plans as to how to, he's going to earn, that's a big red flag. And remember, I'm not talking about you know, the family falling into, into bad times. I'm not talking about incidentals. I'm talking about somebody who says, I want to get married. A man must leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. That man must have economic independence, must be able to show that he can provide for his own family. Remember now, we are not joining families. We are starting a new family. He must provide for that. Emotional maturity is the third sign that um, your, the time has come to get married. It says here that a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they should become one flesh. Um, there is a time when, you know, we should now be mature enough to not have to run to mother or father, you know, when things are happening, when, you know, um, you know, we feel that something is going wrong, something is sick again, it doesn't mean that you can't have support. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you can't have support from your parents. It's wonderful when a parent and a child have that kind of relationship where when it is necessary, the child can come for support. But you must be able emotionally to stand on your own. You must be able to deal with certain things, you know, and not run for help as soon as there is a, a trial, as soon as there's a problem. And here it says, the man must, must, be, be, must cleave to his wife. Cleave is an image of being glued together. Cleaving is an image of our, our willing dependence on each other, not on anybody else but a willing dependence on each other. And cleave here is that it's not like being stuck on something else. It's not like a piece of cloth being stuck on something else. It's like two um, things of equal strength and size coming together and being glued together and becoming one to the point where if you should pull them apart, damage would be done. Emotional maturity is suggesting that um, this time now when I'm ready, I can stand on my own two feet I can deal with things. I can, you know, handle, you know, emotional situations, little challenges and so without having to rush for help. This is an indication that the time has come, I'm ready to get married. And then spiritual maturity. It says the two become one flesh. One flesh, of course, primarily it refers to sexual um, oneness, but in a secondary sense, it speaks to a spiritual oneness. When you, you have here in, in Ephesians 5, a reader, it says a man who is who in, in loving his wife, he's, he should, should wash her with the word. He needs to be able to, um, to, to go to the word of God. Doesn't mean that he has to be a theologian. Doesn't mean he has to know the Bible from cover to cover. But he must have that maturity that says, my answers are in the word. When the challenge comes, he goes to the word. It's not about him knowing the word, but it's about him knowing that his reliance is on the word of God, or his, his reliance is on God, and God speaks to him through, through the word. Spiritual maturity here is suggesting that he is ready to leave. The time has come. So, so getting ready to marry or marrying at the right time is not about a particular age. It's about, it's about readiness in these sense, about physical and economic readiness. It's about um, emotional and spiritual maturity. I'm ready now to stand on my own. I'm ready to, with my partner, to start a new unit, a new family, separate from us or our families of origin. 
And third, in our step towards the ideal marriage is having the right attitude. Having the right attitude, the right attitude. The husband should have the right attitude to his wife in that he should love, love his wife. The husband, the, the right attitude that will lead towards the ideal marriage is the husband loving his wife sacrificially, unconditionally, and completely. And I don't have time to talk about all that Paul speaks of in Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 28. He says the husband should love his wife as Christ loved the church. You'll notice the passage begins by saying the wife should submit to the husband. But I want to suspect that Paul began with a wife, not because she's to begin the process, but it's just one line he gave to her. He says, wife, you must submit yourself to your husband as to the Lord. But he had quite a bit to say to the man. You know, you must love your wife. And it begins there. The submission of the woman to the man begins in the man loving his wife. When the man loves his wife, he sets the environment for the woman to submit. And this is not license for the woman to be rebellious, but it's two of you coming together from two different cultures. The man has a responsibility to lead, and he has a responsibility to lead in the sense of creating that environment so that the woman can submit to him. And so it says, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And we know that Christ loved the church to the point where he gave himself for it. You know, he cleansed her by the washing with water through the word. It's talking about here the ability of the man to handle the word enough to, to teach his wife. And not just to teach his wife, but he has enough knowledge of the word to be guided by the word. So the word, the word instructs him how to deal with his wife. And in Peter, Peter chapter 1 Peter 3, it says you should love your wife according to knowledge. So it means that as your wife changes and as she adjusts and as she moves from one stage to the next, you must observe her and watch her and follow her and adjust your way of loving her. Adjust your way of washing her with the word so that she can, so that as you wash her with the word, you can present her to yourself as a radiant church. It says that Christ here presents the church himself as a radiant church. And he's saying, this is exactly how the man should love his wife. You should wash her with the word, teach her the word, help her with that attitude so that it's like he's presenting a radiant wife to himself, a radiant wife, a wife who is glowing, a wife who is happy, a wife who is pleased, a wife who feels fulfilled. Man has a big, a big job to do. So when, it, when, when, it, when, it, when uh, we're not trying to frighten you know, about getting married, but you know, people need to understand what they are coming into and what the expectations are with, when we're getting married. Um, Paul says the man should love his wife as Christ loved the church, sacrificially, unconditionally. Again, we are the church. We know how we mess up all the time. We know how we sin in our thoughts from sunrise to sunset. And Christ has to be constantly cleansing us and washing us. As we come to ask for forgiveness, he's forgiving us. It is saying that the woman is not perfect. Neither, neither is a man perfect. The man has a responsibility to love his wife unconditionally. So the wife who is loud and boisterous and the wife who is not feeding and preparing his food and who is doing all kinds of things that will make a man bring her. Paul is saying you should still love your wife unconditionally. There should be no conditions. Last week I spoke about the fact that, you know, um, you know it's not, we don't have to, love is not a part of finding that person. Or it wasn't here, it was somewhere else. Love is not a part of finding the person. It's about wisdom. But once you find the person, you are to love the person. And Paul is saying here, you know, the man must love his wife. Um, sacrificially, unconditionally, and completely. There are no two ways. And so even though in Matthew, Jesus seemed to suggest that, you know, there is one ground on which the man, on, one ground on which divorce may be contemplated when it says, except for fornication or um, adultery. It's about fornication or sexual misconduct. He's saying, it's like he's saying, when it comes to sexual misconduct, there may be a ground to, co to contemplate divorce. But then it says, love covers a multitude of sin. If, if a man is going to love his wife sacrificially and unconditionally, then it doesn't matter what she does. 
his love is supposed to override the sin. And again, this is not license for a wife to, to sin or do anything. But this is for the man to be knowledgeable. The word of God says you should love your wife as Christ loved the church. It says love her completely. Love her unconditionally. And love is not a feeling. Love is not talking about liking. It's about loving. It's about treating her in, in, a, in a manner that makes her better. It's about treating her in a manner that you, you, you forget the wrong that she has on you. Forget how she has hurt you. Loving is seeking the best for her at all times. And that's what love is. And Jesus again says, a new commandment I give to you. So whatever the reason a man has, you know, to be angry with his wife, to be upset with his wife, to contemplate that he wants to be in, de independent of her, love covers a multitude of sin. A man must love his wife, just as though Christ loved the church. I could speak on that till midnight, but... Um, I'm not Paul. So if Eutychus falls out of the roof, I can't raise him. So in terms of having the right attitude, the attitude of the husband is to love his wife under all circumstances. And the attitude of the wife is to submit to herself, to her husband, unreservedly. As I said before, the husband, you have a responsibility to create the environment to make it easier for the woman to submit to you. But um, the submitting of the wife here, I won't say much, but I want to say that Generally, it speaks of attitude. The wife is, is like the wife is um, acceding to her husband's leadership, is saying, I agree to your leadership. And sub, submission is never forced. It's never forced. So a man who is insisting that his wife submits to him is, is, is talking about subjugation. He is putting her down. Submission must flow freely from the wife. And submission is, is, is really about the attitude. Um, it says here, so the woman should submit to the wife. And then in chapter 5, verse 33b, it says, and the wife must respect her husband. Respect her husband. One of the biggest needs a husband has is for respect from his wife. And every wife needs to realize that. You respect your husband. Now, I said before that um, when it speaks of submitting to the husband, it's like it's about attitude, generally speaking. When it speaks of respecting the husband, it's kind of slanting to how we speak to her husband and speak of her husband. You know, um, the way a wife speaks to her husband can communicate to him whether she has any respect for him or not. And if you speak in a condescending manner to him, if you speak like you're going to put him down, if you speak like you're above him, you're better than him, speak like, you know, I have no regard for him. This is going to come in. He's going to interpret it as disrespect. And so Paul is suggesting here that um, the wife must respect her husband. You must be careful of how you speak. Um, you know, the, just to use an example, we often see the bedroom as the bedroom as a place for the husband and wife. You know, it's a private space, but we always, not always, but most time we are thinking of it in a sexual way. You know, where the bedroom is where you, you go for your sexual um, pleasures and so forth. Yeah, that's true. But the bedroom is also the place of privacy. It's a place where the woman can speak to the man when the man needs to be spoken to. The bedroom is a place where, you know, you lock the doors and the children outside are not here. You can speak to him man, like a man to man, face to face. And you can say to him, no, you're not, you're not doing this right. You need to think different. You can speak to him. As a man, in the bedroom, you know, if the man is messing up, the woman doesn't have to be, be thinking about who is watching and who is listening and all of that. You speak to him as firmly as possible. Men don't stone me, but that's, that's a part of what the bedroom is about. The bedroom is, is a place where you, you decide how you're going to raise the children. But it's also a place where you talk about the, the problems you have between yourselves. And if the wife has a problem with the husband, that's the place to talk to him. And when they mess up, you tell him you mess up. And when you come back out to the children in the living room, you're not going to tell them that, well, daddy never mess up. You and daddy are going to tell them that daddy mess up. But it's, you're going to communicate it in such a way that they realize that even though daddy mess up, you know, um, it, it doesn't give mama, mommy the license to, to berate him and to belittle him and to emasculate him. She still speaks to him with respect. 
So speaking to the speaking respectfully to the man is not about is not about giving him license and telling him it's okay to go on with all kind of bad thing. You're going to support him anyway. When you're out a road, when you're in a church, you need to give him that due respect. You need to speak with him and speak to him and speak of him, you know, respectfully. But you know, if if he, if he needs to be spoken to, you go in the bedroom and you speak to him. But respect is important. So that's term of attitude. In terms of attitude, you know, both must submit to Christ. And it says that in verse 21, when he was speaking to the, to the church generally. So um, the right attitude for marriage, the right attitude that should guide marriage is the husband, you know, having that attitude of love towards his marriage, his wife, the wife having that attitude of submission and respect towards her husband, and both of them having that attitude of total commitment and submission to God. So the man who, for example, is insisting that his wife should submit to him should not, should never ever demand submission from his wife until, you know, together they are submitting to God. And when you're submitting to God together, it really cuts out the need for you to demand submission. So the attitude, driven by the right motive, is a final um, indication that you're on your way to an ideal marriage. Let me handle this one carefully. Um, last week I read from 1 Corinthians 7 verse 7. It says here that, but if you cannot restrain your desires, go ahead, go ahead and marry. It is better to marry than to burn. Um, there comes a time when, you know, we have that need for sexual intimacy and companionship. And Paul is saying, if this becomes overpowering, you need to go and get married. Paul is not suggesting that this is sufficient enough reason for you to get married. By no means. But he's saying, it's better you marry than to burn. Clearly, he's really saying here that, you know, even if it means that you're not going to have the ideal marriage, it's better to marry than to commit a sin. But as a bare, bare minimum, you're not going to get the ideal marriage if it is just to, um, to satisfy a sexual pleasure. Um, there are others of us who, you know, we want to have children, and nothing is wrong with that. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. So there comes a time when you, you have that desire for children. It may be the Lord telling you that this is the time to get married. Maybe the Lord telling you that this is a good motive for married, because it, it is. There are too many no, not knocking single mothers by any means, by any stretch of the imagination, because we become single mothers for different reasons, through death or divorce or any other reason. Some of us become single mothers because it's a choice. But um, there are a lot of us now, a lot of women these days, professional women who have the, the economic means and the financial means to raise a child. And they think, well, the pickings are, are scarce for uh, for a husband, so I'm just going to go have a child because I have the money to take care of him. But children need more than money. They also need the nurturing that comes from the, the husband. So, um, yes, there may be a time for that. That may be an indication. But the biggest um, motive, the best motive that is going to move us towards that ideal marriage is the one we see in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. And let me just quickly talk about it. It says here, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, what I am talking about Christ and the church. Paul is talking about marriage, and he says he's talking about Christ and the church. In other words, what he's saying here is that, is that, um, Having a desire to make your marriage count for God is, is to, to say, well, I want people, when they look at how my wife and I relate together, they think of how Christ and the church relates. Because this is what he's saying here. When, when they speak of marriage, I'm speaking about Christ and his church. When Paul speaks about his, the, the husband loving the wife and the wife submitting to the church, he says, this is, this is what we are, this, this is what happens in the church. 
You know, Christ loved the church without condition. And he's saying, this is what God is calling married people to do. He wants you to live in such a way that when people look at you, they, they understand what the relationship between Christ and the church is like. When they see a woman who messes up and her husband forgives her, they realize that this is, this is a reflection of the forgiveness that God has for the church, you know, when we, and for us when we commit sin. He's saying here that the single most important task that God has for the married couple is to forsaking all others, focus on doing everything possible to help that life partner to be all that God has called him to be. Last week I said that the most important thing for the single person is to, you know, forsake everything else and just focus on the word of God. Here, Paul is saying, if you are married, your job, your number one job is to focus on that person who you have chosen. Not a person who you think God has chosen. Adam had said, this woman that you give me, and she had the cause of it. God is saying, you must pick out that person out of all the billions of women that I have, are the men that we have. You pick out that one. When you pick out that one as a believer in Christ, as a believer in whom the spirit of God dwells, he's saying, I want you to focus on making that person his best representation of, 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 of what a, a person should be. And as you do that for him and he does that for you, you are both making the best representation possible of, of what the church is like, what relationship between Christ and the church is like. The married, the ideal marriage ends up reflecting or showing the kind of relationship God has with his, with his, his wife, which is the bride, which is us. Nothing comes close to that awesome responsibility. Not even the church. The most important responsibility a, a husband has, I'm not talking about parents yet. Next week I talk about parents. The most important responsibility a husband has in the sight of God is to, is to the nurturance of his wife and to build her up. And the most important responsibility the wife has is to build up that husband. Not church work, not your parents, not even your children. Your children are your responsibility. And they are your temporary responsibility because when they become adults, God wants them, God wants you not to have them joining with another family to expand a kingdom, but God wants you to free them up to go and to, to create families of their own. So when the children are gone, you are left together again. The most important job that God has for a husband is the elevation of his wife, is the care, the love of his wife. And the most important job he has for the wife is to, is to respect and submit to her husband. When you do that, there is no greater testimony of the love of God. There's no greater testimony of the salvation that God has given you. Marriage is not anything light. The ideal marriage is possible, but ensure that you go about it God's way. Find that right person. Get married at the right time when the conditions are in place. Have that right attitude to your partner and to God. And have that motive of not pleasing yourself, but living in such a way that when people look at this couple, they see Christ and his church. May your marriage be indeed the ideal marriage where as men see your good works, they glorify your father who is in heaven for his name's sake.